In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you find this morning's gospel lesson dense and difficult to understand, it's not because of the time change. As the sheriff in Cool Hand Luke said, what we have here is our failure to communicate. <laughs> okay, in that context, the sheriff was torturing Paul Newman's character, and in our lesson today, Jesus is trying to teach Nicodemus, so a bit different. But Jesus is patiently trying to lift Nicodemus' understanding of spiritual things to a new level. In this gospel lesson we hear this morning, it follows on the tale of Jesus enraging the temple authorities by storming through it and cleaning it of the money changers and the thieves and the corruption that he found there. Nicodemus is a leader in the life of the temple, but he sees something holy in Jesus. Nicodemus is curious. He wants to know more. God has spoken to his heart in a strange and unexpected way. But he's well aware that in his place of leadership, he can't risk being seen come to learn from Jesus. Nonetheless, he can't stop himself. He's pulled by God in his insatiable desire to know more. But the spiritual life is difficult to put into words. Certainly, we don't often think of language as a part of the created realm, but it is. And just like other parts of this realm, words can certainly point towards God, and we certainly have lots of words that do point towards God. But words cannot fully express things of the heavenly, eternal realm, the things of God. An example some of you have heard me use before is Dante's beatific vision of God. Dante, an epic poet, knows words. If anybody does, he does. And he's prolific. He uses lots of words really well. It takes him three amazing volumes of poetry to talk about the pilgrimage of the soul through the spiritual realm. Many of us are familiar with the Inferno, but his third volume is the Paradiso, where he's ascending into heaven. And in the last canto, in the last chapter, he's surrounded by the saints, and he finally has a holy vision of the Trinity. And the poet who had three books full of words is rendered speechless. He admits to the reader that he has no words to describe exactly what he has seen. This is the same limitation or similar limitation that Jesus and Nicodemus face in our story today, and frankly that all of us face when we're trying to talk about things spiritual, because it can be difficult to talk about spiritual things using these limited earthly words that we have, yet try we must. In this very personal exchange between Nicodemus and Jesus, we see where all of us must begin our spiritual lives in Christ. Firstly, we need to clear our daily lives and thereby our souls of distractions and idols. This is certainly one way of understanding Jesus cleaning out the temple. The temple can represent our souls, our hearts, the center of our being. And the toughest idols to deal with are the ones that most pervade our lives and probably are going to make you a little bit upset to poke at them. <laughs> we allow these things to fill up the empty space in our lives, that space where we need the Holy Spirit to move in. 
our addictions, our busyness, our tendency to overwork or overschedule, clearing that out with Jesus' help, we set aside time as our first offering to God. Like Nicodemus, we then come to Jesus perhaps timid in our boldness, perhaps timid in our ignorance. But admitting that we need to learn is the second crucial step because it means that we have acted in humility. All the Christian mystics and theologians agree that true humility of spirit is necessary to move forward in the spiritual life. We need to see our need, our lack, our inability to save ourselves. And if you think that is hard, think about how hard it must have been for Nicodemus, a leader of the temple, a leader of that pinnacle of Jewish life in, Jerus in Jerusalem. How hard it must have been for Nicodemus to admit his need to learn from Jesus. With humility, we come before Jesus, and then Jesus begins to teach us. Jesus starts with concepts that we are familiar with, things that we know. We see that in this story this morning when he starts with concepts that Nicodemus would have known. Nicodemus would have known about the idea of a life in the spirit that transcends the human spirit and understanding that would not have been news to him. But building on that foundation, Jesus begins to teach about heavenly mysteries, those things of the eternal and supernatural realm that are difficult for us to put into words. He tells Nicodemus that he must be, be, that he must be born Anothen. Now, anothen is a Greek word that means two things, again and from heaven, from above, spiritually. One meaning lies on a temporal, linear axis, and the other is on a spatial, spiritual axis. Nicodemus only understands, however, the temporal meaning, again and illustrates his misunderstanding by repeating back to Jesus using a different word, deuteron, to mean again. Well, like Nicodemus, we may be struck by our own limited beginner's understanding of spiritual things. And it's important to note that Nicodemus' faith is not wrong, but it's incomplete. It's only partial. But he keeps trying to understand and Jesus works with him patiently. He doesn't try to water it down. He just hands it to him again and again. Because what Jesus is trying to say is that it's not enough for just part of us to be pointed towards God. The 20th century Christian mystic Evelyn Underhill writes, the spiritual life is a stern choice. It is not a consoling retreat from the difficulties of existence, but an invitation to enter fully into that existence and there apply the divine love of God and bear its cost. Till we accept this truth, she writes, religion is full of puzzles for us and its practices often unmeaning, for we do not know what it is all about. Or as we sing in our doxology during Lent, where the whole realm of nature mind, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Saying we must be born again from above means that we must give God our whole selves the cent beginning with the center of our being, our souls and our hearts, the seat of our will. Christianity as a religion and as a spiritual practice is not a self-improvement project. It is a project 
of giving ourselves over and over to God, who must be at the center of everything that we do. That is how our every moment becomes worship, becomes prayer without ceasing. It is a process of raising the awareness of our hearts to seek God in the humble, mundane, everyday moments, and God coming secretly to our hearts. But this process of putting God in the middle of our being, while at times can be painful or sound difficult, can also be full of delight and joy and simplicity. The poet and scholar Mary Oliver writes this poem entitled Mindful. Every day I see or hear something that more or less kills me with delight, that leaves me like a needle in the haystack of light. It is what I was born for, to look, to listen, to lose myself inside this soft world, to instruct myself over and over in joy and acclamation. Nor am I talking about the exceptional, the fearful, the dreadful, the very extravagant, but of the ordinary, the common, the very drab, the daily presentations. Oh, good scholar, I say to myself, how can you help but grow wise with such teachings as these? The untrimmable light of the world, the oceans shine, the prayers that are made out of grass. Like learning any other difficult concept, repetition and reworking and showing up again and again is all we mere mortals can do. And eventually, the concepts sink in some way, God coming to us in the secret corners of our hearts. None of us will ever fully, will fully understand or grasp God and God's immensity. But that's part of the beauty. God comes to us in the form of Jesus Christ and in the bread and the wine and the holy water. And there's always something more for us to learn. There's always another exciting revelation from God just waiting for us. Importantly, Nicodemus' story does not end here with today's gospel lesson. He appears two more times in John's Gospel. And later in this story, he is the one who goes to the temple authorities to ask for Jesus' body so that Jesus may be laid in the tomb. He grows in his faith. And so too our hope as we journey on this pilgrim's path together in this world is that we may continue to clear out our souls, to make space and time for God, to ask Jesus questions so that we too may grow and learn and deepen in our faith, glimpsing God here and there, his hand at work in the world, going more and more into the profound and falling more and more in love and awe with God. Amen.